or perhaps intimidate a suspect. When we showed Detective Luce Garcella the interrogation tape, he was much more familiar with the strategy than he was with the machine. I personally thought it was a ruse. Using uh, a tool to deceive the individual, which is beautiful as far as I'm concerned, I had no idea what this machine was. Yeah. Okay. Before giving the truth verification yeah. test, this Detective McDonough actually to works to together with Michael to formulate the questions. What are, what are some things we want to learn here, do you think? If I know he did it, if I did it, Okay, well, let's, let's, let's do that then. Do you know who, uh, let's say, took Stephanie's life? Yeah. Okay, would that be a good, fair question? Yes. Okay, do you know who took? Do you know how she died? No. Okay. Soon the test questions are agreed upon, and McDonough asks Michael to sign a form declaring he's about to take the test voluntarily. So you don't realize what's happening. You've now been sucked into a process and that process is going to roll forward for as long as you let it roll forward. So Michael's interrogation continues, all the while his parents assume he's being looked after at a children's shelter, unaware he is in police custody. They just kept grilling and grilling and grilling, and to think that we were at home not even knowing he was near the police station. If we would have known, we would have been there. Now, however, Michael seems almost relieved to be cooperating and submits readily to the voice stress analyzer. Are you sitting down? Yes. Do you know who took Stephanie's life? No. Is today Thursday? Yes. Did you take Stephanie's life? No. Eight minutes later, the truth exam is complete. Let me uh, go over these charts and I'll be back here in a couple minutes, okay? When we come back, what will the voice stress exam reveal? It is 4 p.m. Thursday, January 22nd, 1998, and 14-year-old Michael Crow of Escondido, California, is in the midst of a four-hour interrogation at police headquarters without an attorney or his parents present. His younger sister Stephanie was found murdered at home the day before, and investigators suspect Michael may be involved. He has just completed a voice stress exam. Yes. Now, Detective Chris McDonough returns with the results. What did you think? What were your thoughts through the whole thing? I don't know. Nervous. Nervous? Okay, let's go over that. What were you nervous about? I don't know. That it might be wrong. Okay, in what way? That it might say I, I did kill Stephanie. Okay, and why would it say that? I don't know. Because everyone's already treating me like that. Oh. And I can understand your feelings there, okay? I mean, you're 14 and you've been through a lot, okay? <clears throat> but this instrument doesn't know you, does it? No. Science is in our favor, okay? Technology's on our side, okay? I mean, can you understand that? The detective shows Michael the charts of his performance on the so-called truth exam. They indicate he lied when he answered no to question 12, do you know who took Stephanie's life? Maybe there's something we need to understand about Michael and about your sister that we didn't understand and maybe somebody could have helped. It's okay. It's okay to feel the way you feel. I really okay, but I don't know. Okay. I don't know why I'd say that. I, I swear. I swear to God, I don't know. But the police think they know. Their theory on this second day of the investigation is that a very smart, very lonely, and very angry Michael Crow stabbed his sister to death. His likely motive, a rage-fueled case of sibling rivalry. I'm looking at you right now, okay, and inside you're about ready to burst. We can't bring her back. She's gone. Okay? You're fighting it. You're, 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 I don't know what to do anymore. I understand. You haven't been told that I'm lying. I'm, I'm not lying. Saying, Michael, I'm not saying that. Have you heard me say that? What if they come back and say to you, Michael, we have your hair. While the search for truth is at the heart of the interrogation process, the police are not required to tell the truth. They can use false uh, polygraph lie detector test results to say your polygraph showed you were guilty when that was not the case. And this is all considered legitimate um, interrogation tactics. 
as far as I'm concerned, there are no rules with Hamas. With Hamas. No rules. You have to stay within the law. You have to be aware that people have rights. But there are no rules. And yes, we can use deception. I think many of the American public would be, would be surprised and shocked by this. They're allowed to lie uh, to their suspect. Um, courts have allowed them to lie. They say, Michael, we have your hair in her hand. And all of a sudden, you go... Now what? I mean, what are you going to do at that point? I mean, at that point, I would have to complete wiped out and get it without knowing it. Because I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> Could that have happened? <laughs> no, not that I know of. <laughs> not that you know of. I, like I said, I would have to be completely unaware of it. Okay. Have you ever blacked out before? No, never. Okay, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> if I knew who did it, you would know. Everyone would know right now. Okay, why? <laughs> because whoever did it, I, if I ever find out, I hate them forever. I love them. Soon after, Michael Crow once again is left alone. The next thing is to convince the person that their situation is hopeless. <laughs> they can say that there was evidence found at the scene of the crime, yeah. blood, semen, whatever, uh, that points to the, the suspect. Now, Ralph yeah. Clater, the lead detective on this homicide yeah. case, yeah. an investigator with 23 yeah. years of experience, yeah. returns okay. with his tough, less so patient style and more uh, false evidence. You know there's a lot of blood. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. You mean stay with me, Michael. It's very difficult for the person who did it not to not to, to get blood on them. Yeah. Okay. And not to transfer that blood to other parts of the house. Yeah. We found blood in your room already. God. You're talking to a 14-year-old kid. Wasn't it possible that the blood did turn up in the room? What is that telling the kid? I better confess to this. We use, we use processes called... Where'd you find it? Pardon me? Where'd you find the blood? I, I'm sure you, you know. What? God, I don't... I, no, I don't know. I didn't do it. Does that mean you can't tell me about the knife? I don't know what we're talking about. Okay. I don't know what we're talking about. You're 14? Yes. You got your whole life ahead of you, don't you? Yeah. At that point, he's being, you know, accused of the unthinkable. He's being accused of murdering his own sister. And he's insisting, look, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. But they wouldn't take no for an answer. God. Oh, God. You tell me. <laughs> Why are you doing this to me? If I did this, I don't remember it. I okay. don't remember it then. I and you know what? That's possible. <laughs> Like many boys his age, 14-year-old Michael Crow spent much of his free time playing video games. Very often, perhaps too often, he was alone in his room, absorbed by the violent imagery. On Friday, January 23, 1998, Michael Crow once again enters the all-too-real world of a murder investigation where he is seen as the demon. With advice from a psychologist, Detectives Ralph Clater and Mark Risley confront their teenage suspect with the theory that there may be two Michaels. And now they need the good Michael to help them expose the bad one. You're a child. You're 14 years old. Nobody's going to hold you to the same standards that they would some criminal on the street. Okay? You're going to need some help through this. One way to get this help, detectives suggest, is for Michael to write a letter to his dead sister asking for her forgiveness. 
outstanding tool. I never used the letter, but I have used other emotional tools. Tools like this one that tend to ease a suspect's burden of guilt. Left alone in the interrogation room for the next 24 minutes, here is some of what Michael Crow writes to the sister the police believe he killed. Dear Stephanie, they are putting me through hell, and I think that's what I deserve. If I did do this, then I am insane. The only way I know I did is because they told me I did. I want you to know that I was not myself when I did this. When detectives Clater and Risley return, they focus on the words in Michael's letter that, for the very first time, speak of his guilt. They push him for details of the killing, asking him which parts of his sister's body he might have stabbed in order to kill her. God. But making Michael remember is exactly what investigators are here to do. They tell him he faces two paths. If he doesn't talk and the case against him is made without his help, he'll go to jail. But if he does provide details, he can expect help in return. And you have my personal guarantee that the help you need to accept this is going to be forthcoming. That is what the system is geared for. I want to go down that path. No, no, no. <laughs> cut, cut it out. Cut it out, Mike. Cut it out. The reason I'm sounding impatient, Mike, is the 11th hour is rapidly approaching. All this evidence is going to be in. You put a rush on some things that, quite frankly, is going to bury you, my friend. And you need to head that off at the pass. You need to take the step over here first before you're hit with this avalanche. But at this point, the police do not have any such avalanche of evidence. They're bluffing Michael, and he falls for it. Like, I have this overwhelming feeling that I killed her, but... Okay, let's, let's hear... Let me hear about it. Let me hear about it. I don't know why I feel that way. Let me hear about it. The pressure to get him to talk is working, yet he insists that the only details he can give them are ones he'll have to make up. But it won't, I'll, I'll lie. I'll have to make it up. That's the story, Michael. That night. <laughs> I'm better. She couldn't take it anymore, okay? So. Alright. Got a knife. How many times did you stab her? The autopsy report has already shown that Stephanie Crow was stabbed eight times. You tell me what the truth is. The reason I'm trying to lie here is because you presented me with two thousand. One, I'm just definitely afraid I'd rather die than go to jail. Okay. Where'd you get the knife? I don't know where I did What did you do with the knife afterwards? I don't know what I did with the knife. Give me, give me some of these details. Not your, not your hollow line. The questioning is now in its fourth hour, but what happens in the next few minutes will prove to be more critical than anything Michael has said so far. The teenager accepts the detective's offer to end the day's session and be taken back to the children's shelter, where he's been staying since his sister's murder two days before. While the camera continues to record the empty room, Michael exits with the detectives, who continue talking with him elsewhere in the station house. They tell Michael he is under arrest for killing his sister. According to police, Michael responds flatly, I thought so. I really didn't like her anyway. But he and his father insist there's a whole other side to the story. They took him off camera. He wanted to see us. And what they told him was that your parents you know, know that you murdered their daughter and they don't want to have nothing to do with you no more. They hate you. We're the only ones that you have now. And they bring him back on camera and his demeanor changed. He seems much calmer, almost relieved, and much more forthcoming. Because now Michael's trying to please the, pe the only people he thinks he has left. Hey, she loves me. She made me feel worthless. For the first time, the 14-year-old reveals resentment toward his parents and the favoritism they showed the victim, his younger sister Stephanie. And she was like a threat to me. 